Okay, so just to kind of just to kind of set the stage, I wanted to try to understand how certain types of functions might be easier to represent using transformers. Um, and I, I, I focused on a couple of papers. Um, and uh, so I'm, okay. so I think I'm more convinced about transformers ability to, to um, more efficiently rep represent at automata than certain Boolean functions. But what I'm gonna talk about today is, um, is um, the first of the two papers, which is about representing Boolean functions. So I'm gonna, um, I'm not like 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 a hundred percent convinced that it's that, that it's kind of more efficient in um, in certain ways. Um, somehow the construction still feels like it's not not kind of the the um, really really harnessing whatever it is that that is special about transformers and attention. But um, uh, but just to um, but I do want to sort of set the um, set the stage by putting things sort of in context. So um, okay, so let me let me just today I'm going to be talking about representing. Hi, Ellie. You're a bit off the uh, the screen. I am okay. I mean, I I see the. Uh, yeah, oh. I didn't get a chance to to adjust. Because uh, of our technical issues, so let me try to adjust it now. <clears throat> Make it a little bit closer. Do that. Do this. And. Ish. That should do. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Toby. Thank you. Okay. So, um, representing Boolean functions. <clears throat> um, with ReLU units and transformers. Okay, so let me just um, so let me just recall that a Boolean function you should think of as um, a decision problem, or rather a binary function, but just restricted to the vertices of the the unit cube in whatever space that you're interested in. So a Boolean function looks like um, a T tuple, a, a map from T tuples of zeros and ones to <clears throat> zero, one. And you can think of this as looking at the vertices of the unit cube in RT and labeling them red or blue, depending on um, one or zero, um, whether their output is one or zero. So a Boolean function, you can think of as a decision problem. on the vertices of the unit. Um, and I just want to remind you that in, in um, at, at the beginning of week two, so the first day that I was here, um, I proved that any Boolean function can be represented by um, a neural network with, um, with a step function as the activation function. Um, where the, the two values that the step function can take are one and zero. I think I might've used plus one and minus one, but it's all the same, um, the same kind of idea. And I'm gonna use zero and one today too, because that's, um, that's what the reference that I'm, that I'm talking about uses. Um, the, the references that I'm talking about use. <clears throat> um, okay, so, um, but you may also remember, so that so that construction was using a depth two neural network, so that just had a single hidden layer. And you might also remember that that um, 
it was based on really representing the Boolean function using this particular kind of um, represent this, this particular universal representation of Boolean functions by what's called disjunctive normal form. So if you remember what, what that is, um, you essentially look at the pre-image of one um, here, and that gives you a list of vertices on which the, the, um, the, the complete list of vertices on which the function outputs one. Um, and then you, you, you cut them off by using um, ands um, of literals, where, where a literal, literal is um, just one of the coordinate functions or their negations. Um, and so um, I'll write something down in a second. Well, I'll just say, recall that the construction um, of a zero one step neural network of depth two that I gave in week two, day one, um, depended on so it was quite quite a universal construction, but it depended on um, on representing f in disjunctive. So oh, it's, it's an ors of ands of literals and their negations. So where literals here are the coordinate booleans. And um, so what I'm, what I'm trying to motivate here is that this construction, though universal, so you can use it for any Boolean function, um, it's, it's not great as a construction um, in the sense that, um, uh, so I'll say moreover, the, uh, um, the size of the hidden layer um, can be exponential, something like this, um, because the because the number of um, um, you know if, if if you allow yourself to negate, um, then then kind of the maximum size that this hidden layer can be is one half of um, the total number of vertices. Um, yeah, you always want to pick. Um, yeah, you can either you can either choose to choose to pick the preimage of zero or the preimage of one, whichever has fewer. So. Um, so the point is that that the the you have no real control over the size of this hidden layer using this disjunctive normal form. Um, and sort of a, um, so I wanna give a little bit of a, um, uh, kind of um, a little bit of a aside for context. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm somewhat new to, to notions that are, that are um, routine and standard for theoretical computer scientists. But um, so, so sometimes um, as a mathematician, I'm not, um, you know, if you have a construction, you feel that that's great. But, um, but if, if, you're, if you're a theoretical computer scientist, that's not enough because you want to be able to not only um, uh, implement the construction, but have it scale. So it's really not great if if your construction involves um, having to 
having to implement something which is exponential in the size of whatever it is, whatever problem it is that you're, oh, I guess this should be T because I'm making this T. <clears throat> Um, so, um, so, so that's enough about, about this particular kind of efficiency, um, a particular kind of notion of efficiency. Um, I also want to just say a few words about interpretability. So this, this construction that we gave on the first day for Boolean functions was not great because it was exponential in the size of the hidden layer. It, um, we, we had no guarantee that um, the size of the hidden layer would be smaller than exponential. Um, however, it was kind of good from the point of view of interpretability, um, at least in a certain sense. So, you know, when we're, when we're giving constructions, we would like um, for them to be efficient, and we would also like for them to be interpretable in whatever sense we mean. And um, one thing that is good about this construction, so, so maybe I'll just say, um, so this is bad from the point of view of scalability and efficiency. There's matters up here computer scientist, um, but it is good somehow from the point of view of um, sort of um, from the point of view of um, interpretability. And this, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to say super convincingly because I, because I just tried to get an understanding of this recently, but, but but I think that what I'm about to say is the way that this is thought about. Um, so this disjunctive normal form is an example of an alternating circuit. More general, um, logical circuit. <laughs> That is all for the day. So, um, <clears throat> um, I guess I should call this a logical threshold circuit. So, um, so when we were first starting to talk about um, uh, neural networks with step activation. Um, uh, I defined what's called a perceptron. Um, and if you remember, a perceptron is just, um, well, it's really the same thing as a, um, uh, a neural network with step activation. So the point is that you have your, your, um, your layers. <clears throat> And in each of these layers, you have an affine linear function followed by an activation function, which is just a step function. Um, <clears throat> uh, and this is, this is what's called a perceptron network. And depending on what the affine linear functions are, these maps are sort of more or less interpretable. So, I mean, you, you know, somehow these, um, uh, the best affine linear functions are ones that are that are really just picking out coordinates. These are the ones that are corresponding to literals. So the, the best in, from the point of view of interpretability is the ones that are taking advantage of the privileged bases here to just pick out the coordinates for their negations. So, um, <clears throat> so from the point of view of interpretability, <clears throat> um, um, 
So again, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly saying things in a kind of heuristic way just to kind of get our brains going about, um, about what, um, what might be good from the point of view of interpretability. So the best um, affine linear functions have weights, weight vectors that pick out a particular feature in the privileged basis. And so we've we've kind of um, emphasized again and again that when we have when we have these neural networks, our functions or sorry our vector spaces that we map through have this privileged basis, and these and this privileged basis is corresponding one to one with the neurons of our network, these computational units. Um, so. So if we have a weight vector that picks out one of one feature, it's one of these one hot weight vectors. Um, so standard basis vector. <clears throat> Which are corresponding to these literals. Literals and Boolean logic. Boolean logic. So um, yeah, what do I mean here? Um, we have x so one to the t um, so a literal is um, is um, is uh, something that depends just on one of these coordinates. And it's outputting one if the coordinate is one and zero if the coordinate is zero. So this is, this is, this is sort of exactly what I mean by standard basis vectors correspond to literals in this sense. Um, and the other thing that's nice about this disjunctive normal form, so, <clears throat> um, is that, um, so an alternating alternating logical circuit um, is one for which each layer is um, either an and of literals and their negations or an or of literals and their negations. And they alternate between ands and ors. Um, each layer map is um, an and of literals and their negations. Or or Literals and their negations. And they all. Between and yours. Um. Okay, so when I when I first read this this um, this definition, I wondered why this would be something that that people would want to study. 
um, and I um, and I hunted around online to, to, to get answers about this. Actually, I asked ChatGPT, um, <laughs> which is a trick I learned from Jordy Williamson when he when he visited. Um, I, I mean, I think it actually is in a lot of ways faster than like going to the Wikipedia page or whatever. You just, it at least gets you started. Um, and um, the point that was made is that, um, well, so first of all, if you've done, done a little bit um, of studying about logic and like standard logical operations um, um, and know about De Morgan's laws and things like that, you know that when you have um, just a list of conjunctions um, or, or a list of disjunctions, so conjunctions is a, a list of ands and disjunctions are a list of ors um, of various inputs, um, then it's just a lot easier to do the sort of calculus of, of um, uh, the sort of logical calculus on, on it. But also this is, um, and, and I thought this was interesting, this is actually um, like the depth of an alternating circuit is a good measure for the depth of the corresponding Boolean statement. And the, the, the reason that was given, which, which I, I buy, is that and um, like a collection of and statements is like a um, for all. And a collection of or statements is like a there exists. And very often when we make quantified statements in mathematics, we alternate those. So for all blah, there exists blah, such that for all blah, there exists blah, is the kind of statement you might make in mathematics. So what do you mean by the depth of the statement? That, that just means you have an and layer, then you have an or layer, then you have an and layer, and the number of those is the depth of the function. So, so um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what I'm saying, um, there are certain theorems behind, behind it that, that, um, that I don't know yet, but, um, um, but I think what I'm trying to just make is a, is a heuristic. So if you're able to write a Boolean function, all things being equal, you'd want to write it as, um, yeah, you would want to write it as low depth as you can, but while maintaining um, uh, tractability of the number of nodes in each layer. So you don't want the nodes, the number of nodes in each layer to grow exponentially because then you're having to write down a bunch of, um, a bunch of like individual things for the list of ands. Um, and same with, same with the ors. Um, so, um, and, you know, ideally, so what, what computer scientists study is which Boolean functions can be represented by an alternating circuit with polynomial, with at most polynomial width, um, and what's the minimum depth of such a circuit. So these are the kinds of questions that the theoretical computer scientists who study, um, study representing, or yeah, who study representing Boolean functions in this way, in various ways, study. And it's, it's, very, intimate, it's very intimately connected, I believe, to, um, to the question of, you know, if you're making some, yeah, the, the complexity of a Boolean function is well measured by these various notions of complexity for, um, for representing it in these various ways. So I think I'm, I think I'm trying to make make the point that um, uh, that the, the ways in which you represent functions of various types make them more or less efficient and more or less interpretable um, depending on on the on the format. So let me um, let me now focus on a particular Boolean function, um, the one that a, a generalization of the one that <clears throat> that we talked about on the first day of the second week this class. That is, um, so here's a, here's sort of the canonical hard. A 
computationally hard Boolean function. Okay, so this is often called the parity function, um, but sometimes also just called XOR. This is, um, you should think of zero and one as being um, the classes for Z mod two, um, and this is being Z two arithmetic, uh, Z two sum. So um, defined as X or it's one if the sum is odd and zero, it's even. And let me I'm gonna draw the three dimensional version of this. And one way in which um, people argue that this is hard or complex so here's the well, here's sort of an obvious claim. All n greater than or equal to two x or is not implementable. Step one, um, zero to one step. Network. Okay, so that's sort of obvious because the red points are not linearly separable from the blue points. You can't draw a single affine hyperplane to put the red points on one side and the blue points on the other, as long as n is greater than or equal to two. Um, so, um, but, but what is less obvious? Um, any depth to alternating circuit I'm sore. must have width. At least the n minus one plus one. So the 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 construction that we gave last time, if we were to try to generalize it, we somehow can't do any better for this function. Um, so I'm so I'm not going to prove this, but I'll. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give a reference for it. It doesn't seem that hard, actually. Um, and I'll give a reference over. Over, uh, over email and on my, on my website. 
but what I what I want to focus on is um, uh, so first of all, I'll, um, I will give us give a construction of a depth two zero one step neural network that's actually quite compact that does compute it. And then I'll talk about some of the properties of that, that construction. Um, uh, and then I'll move on to saying some things about transformers. So, um, That implements XOR. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm kind of I'm, I'm focusing on this example because this ends up underlying a bit what um what they're trying to do in this transformers paper. So um, the, the construction that we're going to be talking about um, of a depth two zero one step neural network that implements parity um, seems to be kind of a kind of a um, a baseline and a, a a sort of model for what they're trying to do in this transformers paper. Um, I believe. Um, or at least they're they're using what seems to me that they're using some some sort of properties of this in that paper. Um, okay, so let's let's um let's prove this. Um, and and by the way, Sophia has also been been thinking about about this um, about this parity function and uh, what I'm going to present. She she found it. Okay, so um. So let's see. Um, okay, so so the idea is to to actually look at the geometry here. So uh, let me let me actually draw this. I shouldn't have erased it. Um, so I'm I'm drawing the the um, vertices of the unit cube here in this way to emphasize that um, that actually, so something that we secretly know about the parity function um, that helps us understand how to construct this. So, I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm, what, what I'm trying to motivate here is that, um, is that in in the absence of any information, something like an alternating circuit is quite interpretable. Um, but there, you know, there are some additional benefits that we get from understanding geometry that um, that uh, that that allow us to come up with a simpler implementation. Um, right. So using the fact that we understand geometry and and also that we understand the symmetry of the the parity function um, gives us some insights into how to construct this, this neural network. So the first thing we notice is that um, uh, is that the parity depends only on the sum of the of the entries. So um, so in particular, if you um, if you draw it like this, you're you're lining things up. So so everything in this line has the same parity. Everything in this line has the same parity. Everything. So so um, 
which is great. So I guess the, the first idea is to make our, um, make the hyperplanes in our, um, in our first layer reflect that. So um, the idea is to, oh, we're doing Rn to Rn to R. So this is the claim that we can, we can come up with some weight, weight and bias matrices, um, a weight matrix and a bias vector um, for each of these layers, um, along with uh, post composing with either one or zero. Sorry, um, one if the sign is greater than zero, and zero if the sign is less than zero. Um, so here we have our affine linear function. So, since we noticed that um, that the parity depends only on the sum of the literals, um, then let's make all our weights just correspond to taking the sum. Okay, and then we sort of see. So this is. You know, essentially what we're doing is that we're setting up um, that um, uh, this weight here is always just a bunch of ones. Um, and so, yeah, multiplying this by our vector of literals um, just takes the sum of those literals. And now we notice that um, that as we pass, say, one half and three halves and five halves, um, we're going to pick out um, different subsets of these um, these vertices. So um, V one is going to be say one half up through. Minus one plus one. And what you notice But say V, so I'm going to call V sub K the vertices whose sum is K. Um, and to all X. Okay. If you apply this step activation function to the output of this first layer, then what we're saying is that um, is that the number of these hyperplanes that you're to the to the right of is um, exactly K. So the output of applying this step function is one, one, K of these and N minus K of these. Okay, so we're we're basically constructing a function whose output um, records uh, um, how large the sum of the literals is. 
Um, and now if we let, so here, so yeah, by the way, here, sigma zero one, Z. So, so this is the activation function. I can point it wise. So it's just one if it's greater than zero, zero if is less than zero. And sometimes you put in one half. It's exactly at zero. It's just what the difference. It's sometimes called the heavy side step activation function. Okay. Um, and now you can probably see what we're going to do, which is just to take the alternating sum now in the second layer. <laughs> so I'll leave this picture up. Now, let the weight matrix to the second layer just be one, negative one, one, negative one. And B, um, the bias in that second layer map is just one half. And the idea now is if, so everything gets mapped to a vector like this. And if you look at the action of this on vectors like this, if you have an odd number of Ks, then the output is one. So you're above the threshold. And if you have an even number of Ks, then the output is zero. So you're below this threshold. Actually, maybe you want this to be negative one half um, because you're, yeah, you're trying to see whether W2 times something like this plus this is above or below zero. <laughs> oh, the output of, I'm just gonna use my notation from last time. But you augment everything. You put in a, one, and you put in this, this component-wise activation function. Sorry, this is W1, W2. Um, so, um, this, 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 this is actually just a, like, it, it's a, it's a very simple construction. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I think, I think the thing that I think in my brain is why do you need a transformer to do this? If this is so nice and this is the, this is supposedly the hardest Boolean function, or this, this is thought to be a complicated Boolean function. In some in some measure of complexity, uh, and uh, I don't know that I have a satisfying answer to that question exactly yet. But um, but one thing that I will say that um, that Sophia also pointed out um, is that this construction is not generic. So we talked a lot about the typical. Um, neural network function. And if you if you put these weights and, and biases um, into the corresponding ReLU network, that ReLU network will not be generic and super transversal, which is the sort of typical behavior, um, precisely because these hyperplanes are all parallel. Um, of course, you can perturb things 
to make them non-parallel. Um, and the behavior on the, the Boolean cube should be exactly the same as long as you don't contribute too much. But the behavior outside of there um, should be quite different. So that's that right there is probably one of the um, things to note. So I'll just say Mark. corresponding value number. from generic or super transparent. So somehow the, the construction is very special. <laughs> atypical from the point of view of um, measure and parameter space. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions before I move on to saying some things about transformers? Okay, so the, the, um, the paper that um, I wanna say a few things about is um, Edelman, Goel, Pate, Chang. And I sent the link out over email. Um, but it's called Inductive Biases and Variable Creation and Self Attention Mechanisms. There are two parts of this paper, and I'm going to focus mostly on one part, but the other part might actually be the part that is the, that is the key. Um, okay. So let me, let me just start somewhere. Um, so, the, so the first thing that you might notice, actually, is that the transformer architecture, at least the way that we've been, we've been talking about it, um, doesn't seem to lend itself at least not immediately to representing Boolean functions. So if you remember what, you know, um, uh, the, the main thing that the transformer architectures do is, um, is predict the next token in a sequence. Um, and while you have sort of a natural list of tokens, um, uh, when you're talking about Boolean functions, I mean, your tokens are somehow these strings. Um, yeah, it, um, if you're trying to, to use a transformer to learn a Boolean function, the, um, this next, next token in a sequence prediction task is not the one that you wanna use. Um, okay, so let me, let me, um, let me talk, for a few minutes about how um, people, or at least in this paper, they set up a structure for, um, for solving decision problems with transformers. So here, in this paper, capital T is the context length. <clears throat> D is the dimension of the embedding space. Um, also, we also call the residual string. So, um, so now if you, um, so the prediction task becomes 
if the input is a string of zeros and ones of length t, you want to predict either a zero or a one, basically. Um, so the task becomes, given an input, um, string of zeros and ones, output is in So I guess it is kind of like a like a sequence prediction task, but the but the the next token in the sequence is like is just yeah either a zero or a one. Um, So the way that the way that this paper handles this this task is that um, so it starts by giving a deterministic embedding of strings into um, Things into R D. Okay, so So here, um, the rows are now the, um, so you have T tokens. Yeah, each of the rows represents um, uh, right. um, each of the rows represents an embedding of the token at that position into the residual stream. So um, this 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 was a little bit confusing to me at first, but um, but the idea is, if you remember, um, uh, okay. So um, uh, right. So if you remember the transformer that I described, sort of the the standard transformer that's used for say text generation. Um, uh, each column is um, is an embedded token, um, and the ordering of the columns is captured by um, the fact that when when you do when you perform this this attention mechanism, you only attend to things before you. So the the um, uh, right. The, the position is is captured by um, uh, right the, the position of the token in the sequence is captured both by um, both by where it is in, in this um, in this matrix like which which column it is in the matrix here the rows and columns are swapped by the way um, from from what I described before um, and in some ways, I think it's nicer because then things act on the right. So as you move through, things are just acting on the right. But um, uh, but the point is that um, when you actually perform the output, though, um, of the whole transformer, it, it only looks at the 
the last um, the last token in this um, the last embedded token. Here somehow you're you're actually recording um, a boolean string by recording um, uh, whether whether the entry is a zero or a one and in which position you're talking about. So um, yeah, the setup here is that they start with an actual embedding. They don't learn the embedding. They start with, with an embedding. And the way that they actually, the way that they do the embedding so that it has some nice features is, um, is that they make, um, uh, that they represent position and whether it's a zero or a one separately. And all of the vectors that they use to represent the position index and whether or not it's a zero one are all almost orthogonal to each other. So let me, let me try to, um, I'll say some more about this setup in a moment, um, but just for the moment, know that um, that you have some matrix whose rows represent the um, the boolean string, the length t boolean string, along with where in the string each zero and one occurs. Um, okay, so that's that's the input. Um, and then, yeah. The thing that, again, I, I feel is sort of strange about the setup is that um, uh, they also have, if it's a length T string, they have exactly T attention heads. So they have this self-attention layer. where the number of heads is the context. Um, and then as usual, this alternates with a ReLU neural network block. And there's one more piece of information, which is that they start also with um, with a particular vector that they're going to look at in order to do the actual classification into zero or one. So they have these, these attention heads that are, that are allowing the, the tokens to attend to each other, but they also have one more attention head, which I'll single out. So they have this special vector that they also choose at the beginning, but not here. Which is the only thing really that is, um, that is used to predict either zero or one. So, um, this is involved in the in, in the attention, um, and then it goes through the ReLU MLP. But this is the coordinate that's used to do the classification. So, um, so, so if you remember the way that binary classification is done um, for for a, for a multi-layer perceptron, is that you you um, you choose a map to the real numbers. Um, at the end that, um, and then if you're, if the output of that scalar valued map is above a threshold where that threshold is usually zero, then you output one. And if you're below that threshold, then you output zero. So um, the way that it actually does this, this prediction of the Boolean output is it constructs a scalar valued function by really just by looking at at the, um, at the progress of this particular vector through here. Um, but it's 
it's using all of the other parts of the of the transformer. So, so maybe I'll just say, so I'll just say a few words. So in this paper, um, outputs of attention heads are not added, but preserved as particular coordinates. So that's what I mean by this, but preserved as coordinates. Say it again. No, they are preserved here. So, so, so it's kind of like you, um, you have each of these separate heads and then you have the output of each of the heads. So remember each of the heads has like a, has this, has this um, attention pattern associated to it where it's attending to everything else, I guess, including this. Um, I guess including this. Actually, I'm not 100% sure that it's attending to that. Um, I think it's not actually. It's just attending to the other tokens, the, the other embeddings of the tokens. Um, uh, but this is attending to everything else. So this is head, yeah. Um, how many embedding, because the tokens are size T, right? So were each head is supposed to correspond to an embedding, should there be D of them? Or did I get? Right. So 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 the so there are only two tokens, zero and one. Um and when you embed a Boolean T tuple, you get a um, a list of rows where each row is dimension D. So, um, right. Each row is supposed to be like a snapshot of the process. Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I guess that's the way that we should think of it is that each row is representing what the token looks like when it's in the position, you know, when it's in the position in the string. Um, in the first position in the string, in the second position in the string, et cetera. So yeah, I think I think I think that is kind of the right way to think about these tuples is like a um, yes, somehow secretly they're thinking of it as being like something like like a like a dynamical process of moving between zeros and ones. So I guess when you're when you're in the first position and you're a zero, you are here. Um, and then when you're in the second position and you're a zero, you're somewhere else. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I found I found this kind of a weird way to to set this up, but I guess that it that it makes sense. Um, okay. And then and then somehow the point is here that that um, each of these you know where so you take all of these positionally embedded tokens where the tokens are just zeros and ones um, and and now you map it to, you map it through this, this attention layer um, and it becomes another, um, another collection of positionally embedded zeros and ones, um, but they've mapped through sort of this bottleneck layer in, the, in each of the attention heads. So remember that the queries and the keys kind of map you down into some lower dimensional vector space, much lower dimensional vector space. And then you take the dot product there and then softmax. And that's what tells you how you're attending to everything else. Um, and then you have the, the, um, the, the output, which is the, the sort of mixture using that, um, that weighting from the attention pattern of the values for each of the, each of the tokens, each of the positional tokens. 
Um, and then once you have that, that output, along with this sort of special output, you feed it through the ReLU neural network. Um, and at the end, you just pay attention to whether this is above or below some threshold. The image of that is above or below some threshold. Uh, maybe I'll get to this, but is there supposed to be like a strategic choice for B? Um, you know, um, yeah, I don't know actually. Um, I'll I'll try to say something about that next time, but it didn't give any particular strategic choice. Um, I mean, what, one thing that I'm not saying is that it had sort of three different ways of doing this this embed this positional embedding. And I'm choosing one of them, um, but it didn't give any real indication which one was sort of the best or anything like that. So I just chose the one, um, chose the one that I felt like choosing. Um, but they have results for each of these different ways of doing this, this um, embedding. Um, okay, so maybe maybe what I'll do in my last few minutes, since we're almost at the end of class, and I'm Definitely not going to be able to, I'll pick this up next time to say more. But um, let me just say, let me just give some more details about the deterministic inputs. So um, uh, this zero one token sequence. So you have some matrix whose rows correspond to the positions. T. And then you have um, a two by D um, matrix E, which represents um, whether the entry Is zero or one. And then you have this special B. So. Track classification at the end. And the way that you do your positional embedding is you just add the particular position vector to whether or not you're zero or one. So, um, so let me just be really clear about that. So once you have these matrices P and E, then you can construct your embedding of a T-tuple by adding to each position vector, either the zero row or the one row here. So. So this will be the input to your transformer. So 
sorry, define EX by, um, okay, so, so I'm defining something auxiliary here. So by so this is the um, X one row of E, so either zero or one. So you just add P to EX. So this is this is sort of the, the base object, which is just recording the positions. And then um, uh, you adjust each, each row with um, the row, the, the corresponding row of this one. Okay. And then, um, and then the additional assumptions is that they choose this deterministic positional embedding so that all of the rows in sight are almost orthogonal. So um, this is going back to this um, Johnson Lindenstrauss lemma that I will try to say something about. If not while I'm here at the CMSA, then let me go back to BC. I'll try to say more about that, but. The point is that um, you can have sort of exponentially many more, um, sorry, as n grows, the number of almost orthogonal vectors grows. As the dimension of your vector space grows, um, you, you, can, you, you can only ever have um, n exactly orthogonal vectors, but um, for any epsilon, you can have really exponentially many almost orthogonal vectors. So whether pairwise dot products are less than epsilon. Um, so this is a really, really useful, um, useful mathematical fact. Okay, well, let me, let me stop there and I'll pick it up again next time.